This is the World Teacher Podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 21 of the World Teacher Podcast. My guest today is a highly accomplished academic, author, activist, policy advisor, and public intellectual who's been called one of the world's leading thinkers. Her name is Dr. Narina Hertz. She is an honorary professor at the Institute for Global Prosperity at the University College London. She's advised some of the world's leading business and political figures, written for most of the world's major newspapers, and regularly chairs sessions at the World Economic Forum in Davos. Her TED Talk, which is on the benefits and detriments of relying on experts, is one of my favorites. And on top of all that, she's the author of five books. Her most recent was published in North America last month, and she kindly agreed to come on the show to talk to me about it. It's called The Lonely Century, Coming Together in a World That's Pulling Apart. It's about a topic that so many of us now know on a personal level all too well. Loneliness, a problem that predates the pandemic and has clearly been massively intensified because of it. It's a problem that's hit me really hard, surprisingly hard, during the pandemic. When the first lockdown was imposed, I honestly had no problems adapting to it. I was actually looking forward to the time alone. The spring and summer were great. I spent most of my waking hours outdoors, which makes life really easy to enjoy. But when winter came, everything changed. My walks became much shorter and spending hours alone in a room became my reality for many months. Now, being alone isn't necessarily synonymous with being lonely. I was an only child, so I know this deeply. Kids without siblings, especially if both parents are working, will inevitably spend a lot of time alone. Learning to be happy by yourself is one of life's greatest gifts. There are massive creative advantages to spending time alone. The mind opens and the muses make their way in. The problem for most people is that they have neither enough experience nor enough guidance when it comes to managing the anxious mind. And so they seek escapes. The escapes come in many forms, digital entertainment, drugs, religion, even kids. People seek to avoid facing their own minds in myriad ways. It's really a fundamental human problem. People will be much better off both individually and collectively once we learn to quell the ocean swells of our minds. Aloneness is a wonderful thing. This is true, yet it's also true that being alone for too long, unless you're engaged in a, like a serious yogic or meditation practice or something, wreaks utter havoc on the human organism. It truly undermines our energetic equilibrium and our health. Humans give and receive energy from each other. We're deeply connected. We need each other. If you're alone for too long, at some point, it will transmute into loneliness, the awful, anxious, uncontrolled, and very painful experience of being alone. I was arrogant when the pandemic struck. I thought I was excellent at being alone, and I am. I thought I could be alone without being lonely pretty easily. That was true. It was true until it wasn't. And when it wasn't, it was excruciating. The lockdown forced me to spend much more time alone than I ever would have voluntarily. And there have been three points now where I didn't realize my social energy cup had become so dry that there was nothing but depression left to fill the void. It took me three crises and a book before I fully realized what was going on. That book was The Lonely Century by Norena Hertz. It helped me a lot. Help me see and confront my loneliness honestly, and to uncover the layers of complexity that my mind has been hiding from me, protecting me from, including both loneliness due to a lack of social contact in general, but also a lack of intimacy in my life. It's helped me see the utter cruciality of connecting with people every single day, no matter what, and it may even be motivating me to open my heart to the possibility of finding a life partner. The Lonely Century has also, though, increased my concern for the state of humanity. People are really hurting the world over even more than I realized. It's not just that people are spending more time alone, which in itself could be a great thing. It's that people around the world, especially in supposedly rich countries, are seriously lonely. They're living lives that are nastier, more brutish, and indeed shorter because of it. Dr. Hertz has made me realize how urgent an issue this is. Loneliness was an urgent issue before COVID, and it may be even worse afterwards. One data point of hers that I'd like to share that I think 
everyone should be aware of, comes from studies that looked at the long-term mental health impact on healthcare workers who were quarantined for less than a month in Beijing during the much shorter SARS outbreak in 2003. People isolated in quarantine at that time were more likely to suffer depression, alcoholism, and PTSD three years later. All of which, by the way, tend to enhance rather than diminish loneliness. That's pretty jarring. If people isolated for a month were suffering from the effects of isolation three years later, what can we expect the long-term effects of the COVID year to be? Give that some thought. All this said, the book isn't super depressing. I actually laughed out loud at many points. One thing I appreciate about Dr. Hertz is how she dives into her research experientially. She talks to normal and quite abnormal people from all walks of life from all over the world. For instance, she rented a friend for three hours on one occasion to dive into what she calls the loneliness economy. And on another instance, she trudged through the awfulness of applying for an HR job just to see firsthand what it feels like being interviewed by a soulless AI. Fascinating. It's really a great book. There are excellent analyses of a number of problems we didn't get to discuss in our conversation, like how machine learning reproduces social inequities, the not so stealthy creep in of mass surveillance at work and in the home, and a truly disturbing, though nevertheless captivating, section on sex robots. So please go out and buy The Lonely Century. It's an excellent and important read. And at the end of the day, it's also a hopeful one. It's replete with loads of actionable ideas we can use to make the world a better place. It's had a positive impact on my life. I hope it does something similar for you. This is me and Dr. Narina Hertz talking about The Lonely Century. Dr. Narina Hertz, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, you're a very, very interesting person who's led a quite fascinating life in my view, and you've written quite a brilliant book. Uh, one of several you've written It's called The Lonely Century. I found it while reading the Financial Times a few months ago because there was an excerpt uh, from it there, and it just really struck me as a really important argument, one that is obviously even more important in the context of coronavirus, but was but also one that really mattered beforehand and will continue to afterwards. Why is this the lonely century? So it's the lonely century because from all available data out there, empirical data, what we know is that people are lonelier today than ever before. And this was even the case before the pandemic struck. So even before the pandemic struck, one in five Americans say said that they uh, felt lonely often or always. One in five millennials said that they didn't have a single friend at all, a staggering fact. Um, with the pandemic, of course, making this even worse, around 50% of people in most countries that have conducted surveys over the last few months are currently feeling lonely. So, um, so it, so it is, it is a particularly lonely century, and a set, um, in which really some very um, there's some pretty sad and marked manifestations of how lonely it is. Uh, I met in my journey as I was researching this subject, a whole array of people who were feeling really lonely from uh, a man in Los Angeles who's so lonely he pays to be cuddled, mm. Paul, um, to right-wing populist voters, railroad voter, uh, railroaders in the US who were voting for Trump, who were feeling especially and markedly lonely, to, um, to people who were lonely because their new co-workers weren't humans, but were robots. So loneliness playing out in many, many manifestations and in many different ways, uh, and amongst all age groups, though it turns out that a particular age group is lonelier than the rest. Who are they? The young, mm. which is surprising to some people because, um, you know, I think often when we think about loneliness, we think about the elderly and loneliness amongst the elderly. And it is a real problem amongst that age group. In the United States, 60% of people who live in nursing homes have never had any visitors at all. In Japan, oh, this is a terrible story. In Japan, the fastest growing uh, 
age group for um, people being incarcerated, people being jailed is pensioners, is retirees, because they're so lonely that they're looking for companionship and company and they're intentionally committing crimes like shoplifting in order to be jailed. So elderly loneliness is a real issue and a heartbreaking one. And yet it's the young who are actually the loneliest in society. Um, children, teenagers, and under 24s more generally. This is all very sad, and I'm somebody who cares about humans, and I know that you are one as well. Um, not everyone seems to care to the same degree as perhaps you and I do. If you were speaking to somebody who is a little bit more cynical about life, what would you argue to them about the importance of loneliness? Why should everyone care that this matters, apart from it just being a bit sad? <laughs> so um, I would give them three reasons to the person who thinks, well, so what? So what if people are lonelier? First reason, loneliness is bad for our health. Uh, loneliness is bad for our mental health. A clear link between loneliness and anxiety, depression, and even suicide. But also loneliness is really bad for our physical health. When we're lonely, we are actually more 30% more likely to die prematurely, 32% um, more likely to get a heart attack, 64% more likely to get dementia. And in fact, all in all, loneliness is as bad for our health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day, which is quite an astounding fact. And why it is, is basically because we were never designed to be lonely as humans. Um, and so because we are essentially hardwired to connect, we are creatures of togetherness, essentially. What happens is that when we feel lonely, our body does all it can to tell us something's wrong. And so we get a very clear physiological response. When we're lonely, our heart rate goes up, our blood pressure goes up, our levels of stress in our body, our cortisol levels go up. All of those essentially signaling to our body, don't be alone anymore, go and find your tribe, go and find people to hunt and gather with. And the trouble is that in contemporary life, we don't do that and we remain feeling lonely for weeks, for months, even in some cases for years. And these protracted periods of loneliness, and they can be relatively short to have a negative health impact, but protracted periods of loneliness are what's so bad for our body. It's kind of like in the same way that um, if you're driving a car and you put it in first gear, that's good to take off, but very bad if you continue driving in first gear or even worse, you have multiple journeys in first gear, but that's what we're doing. Um, so we are staying in first gear and so we're harming our engines, our bodies. So first reason why it matters, it's bad for our health, mental and physical. Second reason it matters, it's bad for the economy. So um, not only does loneliness impose a very significant cost on healthcare, um, health, on healthcare systems, given the link with mental and physical health problems, but loneliness is bad for businesses because lonely employees are less motivated, less productive, less efficient, more likely to want to leave a company, so, um, less engaged. An employee who doesn't have a friend at a workplace is seven times less engaged than an employee who does. So loneliness is bad for business as well. And the third reason is because loneliness is bad for democracy. And that's because, and in fact, it was one of the reasons I started researching this book, that's because there is a clear link between the rise of right-wing populism across the globe in recent years, the rise in people voting for Donald Trump in the United States, for Marine Le Pen in France, for Matteo Savini in Italy, for Alternative for Deutschland in Germany, a link between those voters and, the, and those people feeling lonely. Lonely in two senses, lonely that they are lacking in friends, um, acquaintances, support systems. 
In 2016, Hillary Clinton voters were significantly less likely than Donald Trump voters to say that they had few friends, few acquaintances. Mm -hmm. Trump voters much more likely to say, I only have myself to rely on in a time of need. So lonely in that sense, but also lonely in the sense of feeling very profoundly disconnected from the state and from the government, feeling um, invisible, lonely mm -hmm. in the sense of feeling invisible, unseen, uncared for, lacking a sense of social belonging to. Um, and right-wing populist politicians have played very effectively to both these elements of loneliness amongst parts of the electorate. And they're speaking to the forgotten people, you know, really using that sort of rhetoric, but also wielding community like a weapon. Think about Trump's rallies, you know, with branded gear and everyone chanting the same songs and, you know, a real theater of community, almost like a kind of religious experience. Of course, the community these politicians are offering is a very excluding one, but to the group who they're speaking to, they are saying, I see you and you're welcome. You're welcome here. And you have it's really quite manipulative, here. isn't it? Like there's a, there's a really great need out there for social connection. It's a basic human need. And, and we're in a neoliberal context that's increasingly pitting us against each other. And it's been like this for mm. 30 or 40 years. And there's all sorts of people who feel disaffected. And then they have nobody to talk to. And they go online, try to find people like themselves and manipulative algorithms and put people like them together. And then you get like QAnon and, and horrible problems that I see. I see the conspiracy theory kind of manifestation of this as potentially worse than the right-wing populist one because that one you can at least identify and you know, like counter to a degree with like rational arguments but when people no longer believe in truth and are willing to just abandon critical thinking capacity so long so that they can connect with people that's really quite dangerous for society for sure and you know the kind of general radicalization that we see on online and on social platforms um you know is often speaking very directly to people who feel very lonely and are finding community online. So whether, whether in the furthest reaches of QAnon or amongst the incels um, or, um, or in the less extreme but still relatively extreme far-right populist parties or even in the GameStop Redditors who, you know, um, the kind of day traders who are spending their time on these um, chat in these chat groups and platforms where essentially they're finding community and looking for community, which raises the big question, you know, what have we done as a, how, how did we get here? And that's what I really wanted to figure out as I researched this book how has it gotten so bad that people are paying to be cuddled, voting for right wing pop, you know, turning to right wing populist parties, um, or even renting friends? Um, I, I, in, I was in, I actually experimented. I had read that you could rent friends, and when I was in Manhattan, I rented a friend for a few hours. Brittany, um, you know, we. How did you find her? This is fascinating. How do, how do you find your online friend? So, um, well, I had heard about, I had heard that you could rent a friend. And so I investigated and I found a website where there were 620,000 friends to choose from. So wow. 620,000 gig economy workers, essentially, essentially um, whose services that they offer that they sell a friendship. And, um, and I was in Manhattan and I just shopped for my friend. What um, were your criteria? Picked... Well, you know, maybe for people who um, are younger than me or single who've had more, ex have had experience of online dating, it's not, it wasn't as surprising an experience as it was for me, but I've no, I, you know, I haven't had any experience of any of that. So for me, it was a very strange experience to have, you know, essentially photos and profiles of people and be able to pick the one who I wanted to 
go so on weird, my friendship yeah. <laughs> date with. It was it was it was weird, and I was worried. Uh, you know, was this actually something untoward, and what was I getting uh. into here? But I, but it was it was very it was totally legitimate. I went. I met Brittany downtown. We drank matcha tea together. We went to a bookstore together. We went into a clothes store together and obviously it wasn't like being with an old friend but you know when you get a new you have a new friend um and you just meet someone and it's all really fun and you're kind of gelling well it felt like that of course afterwards i reflected upon the fact that probably part of the reason it felt so good was that she was laughing at all my jokes right? part of the reason <laughs> she was laughing at all my jokes yeah was inevitably because i was paying her 40 dollars an hour for the privilege it's amazing the stories you don't tell yourself <laughs> at the time. Um, yeah, it, I did. It did all come clear to me that I was paying her when we're standing in the clothes store, and she turns around to me and she says, "That'll be one hundred and twenty dollars, please." Wow. Uh, but, but yeah, w what kind of a society have we created um, that's begetting these sorts of outcomes? And so I started, and my book. You know, not only makes the case that there's a problem, but also looks at how we got here, and mm. then, of course, what we can do about it. Uh, well, how would you argue, or what would you say are the main causes, fundamentally, deeply, of this sort of cross-cultural global phenomenon? So, a number of drivers, from the fact that we do less together than we did in the past. We're less likely to be members of trade unions. We're less likely to be members of parent-teacher associations. We're less likely to go to church. We're more likely to live on our own. We're less likely to eat together. So, you know, we just do less with others. That's part of the problem. Um, our cities have increasingly been designed, you know, in inhospitable ways, in ways that exclude um, groups desired, um, viewed, deemed undesirable, but also more generally kind of increasingly designed more for cars really mm. than for people. So that's part of the problem. Our workplaces are increasingly lonely. The open plan office, a uh, surprising culprit here that I uncovered in my research, you'd think of open plan offices as being places, most countries, open plan offices are really the norm. And you'd think that this was a good thing when it comes to people feeling connected. Actually, it's the opposite. The research is clear. In fact, researchers who looked at when people moved from office and cubicle style offices, a workplace into an open plan space, they found that people spoke far less to their colleagues face to face and instead communicated far more by email or by some sort of messaging system. Um, but it makes sense, you know, panopticon office, everyone looking at you, um, so noisy, you need to put your headphones on. It's not really conducive to authentic conversations if or any conversations really. So um, the office part of the problem, our workplace, but also, and you touched upon it earlier, um, the particular form of capitalism that has really dominated over the past 40 years, neoliberal capitalism, which has been a form, which is a form of capitalism that uh, really uh, lionized the uh, market and denigrated the value of community and society, a kind of capitalism in which qualities like hyper-competitiveness um, were valorized and selfishness were valorized mm. um, and qualities like caring for others and compassion were disregarded and undervalued, a kind of greed is good, hustle harder mindset in which we came to see ourselves increasingly as competitors rather than citizens, as hustlers, rather than helpers, as takers, rather than givers. This kind of me first mentality, which was um, the tone from the top, but also a tone that we um, came to take on board individually, um, that inevitably was going to lead to a more atomized, lonelier, more isolated feeling, electorate. 
One of the things that I found really interesting in your book is when you talk about all sorts of interventions and attempts to try to counter the the trends of neoliberal capitalism, one, one of them was a great example. I think it was in San Francisco. It's called Mission Pi. Uh, this great, like, it sounded like a wonderful community-based organization that really tried to kind of fight all of the trends that you're speaking about, but inevitably, well, not inevitably, eventually failed because of market forces. Could you tell us about that? And yeah, so Mission Pi uh, was this great cafe that I would go to when I was in San Francisco. Uh, yes, they did have great pies. Um, but it wasn't just the pies that I found so appealing there. It was the kind of place clearly that had a lot of regulars where um, where the servers knew their customers' names. The kind of place where you would see, you know, a group of people host having their informal book club at one table and at another table a group of people kind of knitting in like a kind of knitting clutch a place that clearly was very much part of and um locked in and really kind of locked into and playing a significant role in anchoring the local community um a place also with you know kind of good values when it came to the produce it was serving like really knowing the provenance and using local suppliers and also which was committed to paying its uh staff a decent a uh, decent wage and sounds great it was it really was a great was and unfortunately it's it's in the past tense was because of um the fact of the uptake in their area of um, uh, online food delivery services like um, DoorDash or Grubhub. Um, and what happened was that in order, rents were going up, so physical rents were going up, brick and mortar rents were going up, and um, the only way really to survive would have been to migrate um, significant service, significant parts of their business to these sorts of online delivery services. But firstly, the commission that these um, services it's took was ridiculous. huge. Yeah. It was, I mean, it was absolutely impossible for Mission Pi to stay, exactly, to stay true to themselves um, to their mission to also be good corporate citizens and treat their their staff well. And they also didn't want to have to hike the prices up. Um, so they didn't want to have to underpay their staff and they didn't want to have to hike prices up so that local regulars wouldn't be able to afford um, to come there. And at the end, trying to balance the realities of a market which was increasingly hospitable to big behemoths and increasingly inhospitable to small independent court stores and cafes like their own became impossible to navigate and Mission Pie had to close shop and they sadly did. And you know, unfortunately, the Mission Pie story is a story we see playing out all around us and 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 this was a story that was playing out of course even before the pandemic but the pandemic has just made this significantly worse for many of our local stores and cafes and studios who've had to deal with the triple whammy of an economic downturn of um lockdowns and being forced to close for protracted periods and also this even greater um, acceleration towards e-commerce and e-retailing and and what I call a contactless existence. Mm. And over the past year, you know, often we haven't had a choice if we've wanted to get food from a restaurant or cafe. I mean, in London, where I am, um, you know, since December, the only way we've been able to access food from restaurants and cafes has been through these kind of online delivery services because our restaurants and cafes have been closed. So um, to you can't even sit outside. So, um, so um, you know, if we've wanted to do a yoga class, we've had to do yoga with Adrienne or whoever mm. on YouTube because great, there the hasn't, <laughs> right, but there hasn't been an alternative. 
Um, so over the past year, we've been kind of forced into a contactless existence, although this was already an accelerating trend beforehand. The trouble is, whilst some of us may now be thinking, you know what, exactly, she's great, Adrienne, you know what, and you know, it's really convenient. I don't even have to go and kind of walk down the road or get a bus or however I get to my yoga studio and like deal with like the receptionist and actual people. I can do this at home. Trouble is we are trading off, mm. I argue, um, convenience for community mm. and and mental health. Yes. And, and the two go hand in hand. And yet mm. often in our kind of consumerist, um, neoliberal society, we put convenience highest up on the um, hierarchy of what we actually want. Um, not thinking that that can come as a co at a cost too, that a contactless existence may be more convenient, may sometimes be even cheaper. And yet in the process, we're missing out on connection. I think it's a really um, important argument. It's one that really struck me. So I'm kind of an unusual person. I travel around the world for work and I spend, have to spend a lot of time alone. Uh, I'm also an only child. So I, I probably have a greater resilience than average in terms of being able to spend time alone. So when this hit, I was like, oh, this is fine. I can deal with this. It turns out that wasn't the case. It turns out that I have a, I, I can tell myself that I'm fine. I can spend days by myself and I'll be totally fine. Very happy, entertain myself, no problems. But it's kind of like, I'm fine, 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 fine. And then all of a sudden I'll drop off a cliff. I'm not sufficiently aware, I've learned, of my need for sociality because it was always met before. Like as a teacher, you're with kids all the time and you're overwhelmed um, with just connection and you want to crash and you need to crash, you do crash, whether or not you want to crash after work is pretty much the, the case for most people. And it's been really quite um, illuminating um, how important it is to connect with people. Not everybody knows that we have ba basic needs for intimacy and whatnot, but what I found really surprising um, was when I read in your book about the importance of really light social contact, of just the kind of like interactions with the person in the hall, the person on the elevator, the person at Starbucks. And I, after I read that, I noticed, I started, I was paying attention to my behavior and I'd walk into a coffee shop because fortunately we can still do that in Toronto. Um, they're essential because we need caffeine. Canadians can't deal without caffeine. Um, I'd go into a coffee shop and I noticed like, oh, I'd have kind of like a, like a defensive kind of like stance of like, oh, I don't want to have to have a conversation with this person. Oh, but um, reading your writing and your argument that actually that's beneficial for me, I was like, okay, I'll try this. I'm going to just chat with these people. I'm going to be a little bit more open than I would otherwise be. And it... Con it continued it like totally changed my outlook my mood would go from like uh, to like being really happy like with just a really really short interaction and i it's uh, now i i try to make uh, a point of saying hi to everybody in the hallway everybody in the elevator talking to everybody in the coffee shop not on the street so much because i'm a bald white man and people don't like that but uh i can find my places uh for lights interaction and it's not necessarily enough, but it's better than nothing. And I, I think it's really important that we create situations that allow that to happen. And that was what was so beautiful about Mission Pi. But then the the broader sort of economic conditions in which Mission Pi found itself undermined that. And that is really troubling. So like, what yes. do we do? Yes. But those micro exchanges, I call them these micro, micro connections. Yeah. yeah, the micro exchanges that we have in where we speak to the server in a cafe or where we speak to the cashier in the grocery store or we say hello to our local postman or say hello to the person walking their dog uh, really make a huge difference as you have now found in how connected we feel to others and how happy we feel. And, and I think that is what many of us have found hard over the past yeah, is that we've been deprived of many of these, maybe not mm. all of these, but but of many of these. And, and I think we're more cognizant of um, of how important they are. So what do we do about the fact that oh, your your uh, your microphone's falling? Oh, oh <laughs> very <forward>. good. <laughs> well spotted. <laughs> Lucky we were on video as well. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I think my microphone's back. Looks good oh. now. So what's the question? What do we do about the um, challenge to these brick and mortar 
um, spaces? Was that the question? I don't remember what the question was. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I guess what I'm, you have a lot of interesting arguments for what to do about this. Like, uh, yes, we, yes. I, I get it. It's a sad, like, it's a sad situation. And you're Nostradamus and saw this coming even before the pandemic hit, which is amazing. But you have a, a lot of good arguments for what to do as well. One of them is about creating communities of caring. You mm -hmm. argue that loneliness you have a broader definition of loneliness than the norm, than the assumptive one. You, you see loneliness as not just within the individual's sort of uh, life experience, but also as existing within uh, communities themselves and as something that has political meaning. Yes. What should we do to counter, or what do you think are the most effective ways in which we might uh, aim to counter this and really try to build communities of caring? So, um, yeah, one of, you know, I define loneliness as not only feeling uh, disconnected from your friends and family and feeling uncared for by them, but also about feeling disconnected from your fellow citizens, mm. from your government, from your workplace, about feeling uncared for and unsupported, not only by those closest to you, but also by your government and your employer as well. And so one of the things that became increasingly clear to me as I was looking at the many solutions for dealing with loneliness was that, and we can look at those separately, but was that part of what we need to do, part of our ambition needs to be moving forward, not only to feel less lonely ourselves, which is important to address, but also more broadly, how do we reconnect more generally with each other mm -hmm. um, across communities? And I think that's perhaps what you're speaking to there. H how do we come together again as a society, given that in most places our societies are pretty fractured um, and broken along socioeconomic, along political, along um, ethnic divides? And um, and so I really started kind of looking at what was working elsewhere in the world and what initiatives had been playing out that were making real inroads in that regard. And time and time again, it came back to the importance of people doing things with people different to them. Mm -hmm. um, that we're never going to really um, come together again unless we do things with people different to us. And there are different ways this is being um, experimented with and piloted in different countries. In the United Kingdom, for example, at a local government level, um, one local area, Camden, they essentially have co-created um, their climate change policy by getting a group of people who live in the area so selected along census lines, so a representative group, very different, different views on climate change, different age groups, different ethnicities, different backgrounds. And they were charged, this group, with having to come um, to multiple sessions on climate change and together develop the policies for the local area. And it was through that process of having to come up with something together, something concrete, that these very different people learned the skills that fundamentally underpin inclusive democracy, listening to each other, civility, learning how to manage difference, um, critical skills. Um, in France, President Macron has initiated a pilot scheme um, where of civic service for teenagers. So a group of teenagers in the pilot scheme lived together for two months. They had to live together. They had to figure out together who would, how the chores would be allocated, um, what rules would be imposed um, for living together. They worked together. They did voluntary work together. So again, um, very different kids, you know, different backgrounds, different socioeconomic groups. But again, through doing things together, as well as having facilitated conversations around issues, learning how to be and interact with people different to them. In Germany, yeah, in Germany, I love this one, a German newspaper, Die Zeit, they initiated a scheme whereby um, they invited Germans all across the country to join this scheme. And basically you had to answer questions and then they would work out which 
side of the political spectrum you were on. And then they matched up people from the right and the left. So people with very different views on immigration, on climate change, on um, you know whether Germany should be in the EU or not be in the EU. And trade unionists with CEOs, asylum seekers with people who were anti-refugees. Anti and all across Germany, these opposing pairs met up. They met up in beer gardens, they met up in cafes, they met up in parks. And the only thing they had to agree to do was meet up for two hours. In this case, they didn't even do anything together. They just spoke to each other for two hours. And the results were really astounding. Just after a two-hour meeting, when um, the people who took part in this scheme, and there were thousands across Germany who did, um, they found the researchers found that the people who took part just after two hours, saw the other in a completely different light, saw mm. the other as someone who was much more human, someone mm. much more like them, someone who had concerns similar to theirs, often around children, often around family, um, and also said they'd be much more willing to invite someone like that into their social sphere. And interestingly, said that they would trust, that they trusted Germans in general wow. more after that experiment. So um, lots of schemes going on around the world when it comes to bringing different kinds of people together. And of course, a huge opportunity for schools to play a part here. Massive, yeah. For high schools to have shared sports classes for kids with different socioeconomic groups, drama classes for kids from different um, ethnicities and backgrounds and socioeconomic uptakes. I mean, real opportunity at young ages to have kids forge and foster connections with people different to them. I think um, those are, I, th I love the idea of that, the German experiment. Why is it just an experiment? Like if it was so successful, why not continue that and, and allow it to proliferate? It sounds like it's very socially beneficial. Yes, and other countries actually have mimicked it since. Oh, really? um, yeah, um, and well, yeah, I agree. This doesn't need to be. This doesn't need to be an experiment. This, this, such initiatives can be ongoing and and should be ongoing and should be part and parcel of what we do. And yet, everything in contemporary life has been conspiring to do the opposite. To kind of put us actually into our own echo chambers, into our own um, silos, into our own gated communities, where we only interact with people who are like us and only hear people like us and only get the views of people like us and so come all too easily to demonize at worst and at best just not understand people who are different to us. Um, and of course, social media playing a big role in all of this. And we, mm. we haven't touched upon that yet, but um, you know, I began my research very agnostic about the role that social media played in it and in today's loneliness crisis and have come away really convinced that playing a huge role, especially amongst, of course, the young, um, you know, children you know, from as young as the age of eight becoming addicted to affirmation in the form of likes because they're spending their time forging their sense of self, you know, in an environment in which their kind of very sense of identity is fundamentally interlinked with how many likes they get, whether people are sharing their posts, you know, which obviously isn't great. Um, but also, and I interviewed a lot of teenagers for my book, um, you know, many teenagers directly experiencing abuse and bullying on these yeah. platforms. And of course, um, that is going to feel isolating and excluding, but also directly being excluded or whips from WhatsApp groups, for example. You know, many kids nowadays, their schools, their high schools, many of them are on WhatsApp groups, easy to just but not be invited to one. Yeah. Um, but also um, witnessing socializing uh, happening that they haven't been invited to. So, you know, one girl I interviewed, Claudia, told me about how her friends had said they weren't going out after school and then she was in her room and she was scrolling on her social media feeds and she saw her friends hanging out without her and she said she felt so terrible, so Crushed, excluded, yeah. she hid in her room. And what I found interesting speaking to teachers about this was, um, 
you know, it was actually a head teacher who made me aware of this. I hadn't really thought about it. He said, you know, of course, there was always in the case, in the past, cases of a kid being excluded. But in the past, as a teacher, we would typically see this going on. So we'd see a kid not being asked to sit with others and we'd try and do something to intervene. But because so much of their social lives is happening on their phones, we are not aware of it. And ditto parents, you know, so the adult in the child's life, perhaps likely not even to be aware of the extent to which they're being excluded or feeling isolated um, because of social media. And yet their exclusion and their, and their being bullied all too obvious to all their peers. So their shame all too obvious and the adults in their lives unable to intervene. So, you know, when it comes to what can be done, you know, one thing governments really need to do, and I end up taking a very strong line on this, is regulate social media companies much more stringently, especially when it comes to children. You know, in many ways, mm. social media companies are the tobacco companies of the 21st century, and they should be regulated as such, especially when it comes to children. You argue uh, for a blanket ban on addictive social media, not mm. social media uh, in in general for children, for people under mm. the age of majority, depending on the country. Uh, how would that actually work, do you think? Would it would it be just like pass a law that says uh, you can't have social media that's addictive and then put the onus on the company to demonstrate that it's not addictive? Exactly. Okay. So you know, put the onus on them. They um, supposedly have the best brains in the world working on designing their products. So why not design products that are not so addictive, why not design products that actually reward kindness, that reward positive speech rather than reward hate, as they currently do. If you have a hateful word um, in your post, I found out it's significantly more likely to be retweeted, um, you know, rather than designing products that, um, you know, reward us with dopamine rushes for being mean, why not reward us for being nice and kind. So a lot that they could do. And clearly, you know, clearly they're not clearly out of voluntarily. We're not seeing social media companies make the changes um, they need to be changing. And, you know, I think time is now has run out now and governments have to intervene. And in the United Kingdom, for example, a bill is currently going through Parliament, which looks likely to pass. Uh, which would put a real significant duty of care on social media platforms to ensure that um, their products don't cause psychological harm, especially to children. It's not a big ask. No. <laughs> like it really isn't. Like you're just not, okay, you can do business. You're just not allowed to intentionally target and damage the children. But yeah, you would think. Trouble is these um, platforms, really all they've cared about up until now and time and time again it's made clear is growth right and um you know move fast and break things is one of their maxims well it turns out they've broken a lot and continue to break a lot and yet have almost no remorse at all yeah so definitely that's part of the government project that's needed but there's something even kind of you know much easier in many ways that governments could do that would have a huge impact um and really critical is to refund what i call the infrastructure of community that has really been depleted ever since 2008 and the financial crisis when we've seen a steady defunding of government monies being put into libraries, public parks, um, youth clubs, elderly daycare centres, and people need physical spaces if they to be together. Um, if they are to feel less lonely, and also again, if they are to, if there are to be spaces where people can practice those skills that are mm. so important for inclusive democracy, reciprocity, civility. Um, so refunding the infrastructure of communities absolutely essential as well. Couldn't agree more. One of the things I really 
find very interesting about you is you're quite a critic of neoliberal capitalism, but you're also an economist and understand like the importance of being pragmatic and, and realistic. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you look at things in all sorts of different levels. You don't seem very ideological, which I really appreciate. One of your, and you have lots of really good examples of, of voluntary efforts by companies to try to promote kindness. My favorite was from Cisco. They, yes. Can you tell us about how they incentivize kindness in their company? It's such a brilliant idea. It's a brilliant idea. So, um, so Cisco, which is a global technology company, they really put their money where their mouth is. Mm. Um, and they essentially say, you know, what? we value kindness and um, helpfulness and those kind of qualities in our staff. And we really value it. So what they've done is they have a scheme whereby anyone at any level in the company, so from the cleaner to the CEO, can nominate anyone else who's been particularly kind or helpful for a cash reward of up to $10,000. And, you know, what a wonderful scheme. And, you know, I've spoken to many employees there who love the scheme, love, mm -hmm. love the fact that they can nominate someone who's been kind, are very, very chuffed if they've, of course, been nominated, not only because of the cash reward, but just because, you know, it's, it's a lovely acknowledgement of their behavior. And unsurprisingly, um, perhaps Cisco has considerably less employee turnover than the industry average and was voted the best company in the world to work for. Uh, Amazing. Last year by its you know employees. who that would work so well with is children. Like yes. there are so many interesting, I mean, like part of me is kind of aversive to the idea of giving kids money as an incentive, um, but there are also really good examples. Like Dolly Parton gave all the kids in her, maybe not all, a whole bunch of kids, junior high kids in her town, 500 bucks or something like that. And, and with a prize reward after graduation, and then the graduation rates go from extremely low to everybody graduates. Kids are highly responsive to financial incentives, and we don't want to condition kids to only be thinking about that. But what I like is that it's not it, you're looking out for other people and how they're acting kindly and it's creating a culture of kindness yes. you're incentivized to look for kindness and to act kind and i really believe that very quickly people would feel the benefits of giving you're someone who argues very passionately for the self-interested benefits of giving mm. how does and giving help so uh, giving, yeah, giving is good for the giver and not only the recipient um, and not only the recipient, because um, it turns out giving is good for our health. Like mm. people who help others more um, actually live longer than people who don't, which is pretty good. Um, helping others also, of course, alleviates any loneliness you might be feeling because helping others helps you feel more connected to others, to those you're helping and or those who you're doing the voluntary work with as well. So it's helping others, giving is a real win-win. Um, and yet when you think about it, as a society, qualities like kindness, caring for others, giving, haven't been qualities that have been particularly um, well regarded. The market, you know, doesn't reward caring and caring for others oh, in the boring. way is it in the ways it should i mean you know think about it teachers nurses you know are not paid um in the way that they would be paid if we really were as a society valuing these qualities maybe that's one of the good things to come out of this terrible past year is that as a society we do i believe we've people as a whole you know, recognize and acknowledge more the importance of caring for others. You know, when we think about who we've really heralded, who our heroes have been over the past year, it has been people who care for others. It has been our nurses, our doctors, our teachers. Um, so, you know, I, I think there's an opportunity here that there is a, um, you know, we're at this moment where for the first time in a long time, these other qualities are being valued. And when, you, and when you say I'm pragmatic and I'm an economist, I'm not coming at this ideology, ideologically, you're absolutely right. Because you know, this. I think it's important to also say that my message isn't an anti-capitalist one. 
Instead, what I'm saying is that there always were different models of capitalism, right. um, models of capitalism which were more compassionate, more caring. And if you look at the European tradition of capitalism or Asian capitalism, so kind of pre the 1980s, you know, these really were much more collectivist modes of capitalism. If you look at um, the capitalism of Franklin Roosevelt, um, you know, after the Great Depression, this was still capitalism, right. but, but this was a capitalism in which Roosevelt saw the importance of the state playing an important role, saw the importance of giving worker better rights, saw the importance of um, initiating public arts programs across the nation. So, you know, there always has have been other forms of capitalism. In fact, Adam Smith, you know, who many think of as being the um, forefather of this dog-eat-dog -dog type of capitalism that has dominated for the past 40 years. He, at the same time as writing um, The Wealth of Nations, in which he talks about the invisible hand of the free market, also wrote this huge book, The Theory of Moral Sentiment, mm -hmm. in which he talked about the importance of empathy, of the importance of the state providing welfare, welfare, of the importance of the state reining in and gut monitoring big corporations. So, um, so my my agenda and my message is about reconnecting capitalism with the common good, and it's and it's not a pie in the sky vision. It's essentially saying that we really went off course for 40 years and it's time to get back on course. And actually this post pandemic is a really apt moment to do so. I totally agree and so well said. I'm very curious, have you ever seriously considered running for office? I think you would be an absolutely fantastic political leader. And I think the world needs brilliant, caring, compassionate, strong political leaders now. And when, when I look out there, there's not that many great examples. Mm. So, um, so I actually came from a come from a political home. So my late mother, who died when I was twenty, she um, actually headed an organisation in the United Kingdom, the Three Hundred Group, whose aim was to get um, equal number of female members of Parliament in Parliament as men. This was um, thirty years ago. Now that she was doing that, and she. Um, ran for kind of parliament. And so I came, I came from a home in which public service was very much uh, something that was held up. And at various points in my own life, yes, I have, of course, contemplated whether that is the right path for me to take. And up until now, I've been fortunate in that I've managed to exercise a significant political voice outside of traditional politics, mm -hmm. where my ideas are taken up by politicians, by governments, where I am asked to um, advise at these most senior levels, uh, and my ideas are gaining traction in the in the real world. So up until now, that has been the way that I have uh, chosen to exercise kind of my political uh, voice, but. No, you never, you, you know, things may, things may change, but up until now, that, that sounds like a yes, like that right sounds way. like you're running. <laughs> no, Are you running? No, 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 I'm not declaring, I'm not declaring on your show no. with the ah, exclusive. Ah. <laughs> I think I'm you glad, should go, I'm glad that you, I'm glad that you'd vote for me if we were in the same country, of course. I really would, possible. and I'm a UK citizen, so I can actually ah, do that. Ah, okay. I might I've have never done that, vote. but I can. <laughs> Do you have a lot of hope for the future? It, it, you could read your book. One could read your book bleakly. One could also read it optimistically. I see lots of both. How do you honestly feel about the future at this point? So I think, um, you know, I think the pandemic has, in a way, given us more hope. I think as we come out of the pandemic, I think there is more hope that we will address some of the things that went so wrong um, and made this the loneliest century and made this a century in which we felt increasingly atomized and disconnected and fragmented. Um, partly because 
you know, I think qualities like caring and compassion are now more recognized, partly because people want recognize the importance of just being connected to others more than we did in the past. Yeah, and, for sure. Um, and so my hope is that we come out of this kind of with a reinvigorated sense of collective mission that because we've collectively struggled together and we've collectively mourned and we've collectively gone through this crisis, we come out of it with a desire to collectively come together again and help each other um, moving forward and that we are willing to make those trade-offs when necessary to do so. Trade-offs that, you know, sometimes are between what's in our immediate self-interest and what's in our collective interest. Trade-offs sometimes even between freedom and fraternity. Mm. Um, so my hope is that we come out of this more willing to make these trade-offs and, you know, learn from times in history, whether it was Roosevelt after the Great Depression or in the United Kingdom, the founding of the National Health Service in the wake of World War II, um, that we similarly use this moment as a moment to recommit to each other. Um, that's my hope. Um, but of course, you know, hope isn't just a lottery ticket that we sit on a sofa and clutch. Hope is a call for action. Right. And it's so we ourselves have to commit to co-creating a better future. We built a lonely world, but now we do have the opportunity to rebuild one with care, with community, with compassion at its heart. But that will take the actions of all of us. It will take the actions of governments. It will take the actions of businesses. But, it, but there are also many things we ourselves as individuals can do at micro levels to help us as a society come together again and feel less lonely. Even, you know, simply as simple as putting our phones down less and being more present with each other. We're all guilty of it. You know, sitting yep. in a room with a friend or a partner and, you know, all of us on our phones and not actually being present. So be more present with those around us. And as many of the teenagers I interviewed remind me, it's not just us on our phones the whole time. You guys are too. So true. So be more present with those around us. Um, we can commit uh, to invest more in our own local neighborhoods. Um, our local stores, our local cafes, our local studios need us so much right now, but we need them as well. So we need to nurture our local communities and the knowledge that they nurture us. Um, so yeah, shop local, think about whether there are local community um, events you should be showing up at, initiate your own local community events. But also right now, I think, there's a real onus on each of us when levels of loneliness are as high as they currently are, where roughly half of the population are feeling lonely, you need know, to actively think about who in our own network might be feeling particularly lonely and reach out to them. And if we can meet up with them in a socially distanced way, if we can't meet up with them physically, pick up the phone or even just send them a text because just showing someone that we're thinking of them, that we see them, that we're um, that they are visible to us can make a huge difference to how they feel. Beautiful. I think we'll just leave it at that. I really appreciate you taking the time, Dr. Hertz. You're an absolutely brilliant and amazing human being. The next, well, maybe not the next, but the future prime minister of Britain. Uh, <laughs> I really appreciate you coming on and taking the time and, and sharing your research, your knowledge, but also your passion and your love. Thank you so much for having me on. I wish you all the best. You're a great, great human. Please do honestly run, please. <laughs> that was episode 21 of the Rural Teacher Podcast. I'm Gareth Manning. Massive thanks and much respect to Dr. Narina Hertz. I really do hope you and more caring people like you get into power. Please check out our work at narina.com. The educational implications of the lonely century are massive. Kids are hurting the most, and it seems to me like next to nothing is being done about it on a broad scale. It's great that lo lots of school districts, especially in the U.S., are dropping the standardized tests and not forcing kids to so-called catch up on lost learning, which is a nonsense concept to begin with, by the way, that fundamentally assumes all the systemic problems of the school system, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I don't want to go on a rant. That, to me, is the most obvious step. 
but it's not enough at all. A lot of kids are going to need a lot of counseling after this, that's for sure. Moreover, the lonely century is, to me, an urgent argument for totally rethinking our educational priorities. We should create learning systems that challenge all humans to grow and flourish. And that means finding ways to authentically connect kids to co-create communities of compassion, care, and belonging. That means centering social-emotional developments and both modeling and incentivizing connection and kindness. That means helping kids learn to be alone without being lonely. That means creating systems that don't systematically assume mental health to be secondary to academics, but instead systems that see wellness as necessary, indeed as preconditional for effective learning and growth. Better educational models exist, and even better ones are waiting to be designed. We can learn to live happily and healthily in diverse harmony together if we really want to. I, for one, really want to. To do that collectively at scale, education will be key. Whether or not this is a lonely century is ultimately up to us. Thanks for listening.